So I effed up big time. Um, for those of you who have caught my previous video upload, which was a Google stock analysis, I think the first half of the episode was fine. Um, I did manage to convey what I wanted to talk about qualitatively around the company today. But on the second half, while I was building out the model in real time, that's where I screwed up. So I essentially committed the cardinal sin of not checking my workings and formulas before I post anything online. And on top of that, I'm even more arrogant to not do any prep work beforehand and to think that I'm very accustomed or very used to the numbers and I can just build it on the fly while explaining it online. Um, and I, I was probably very distracted by um, the numbers and I didn't do a very brief or quick check before uploading the video. But anywho, anyhow, I think I just wanted to walk you through and to right any wrong. Um, that's why I'm filming this in my lunchtime to basically put up a correction notice or a correction video. So full disclosure, I did not build the model beforehand and I didn't see the numbers. So I was really building it in real time. That's why I committed the mistake of not checking. But that's not an excuse, which probably will make me a lot more cautious and careful in future uploads. But long story short, um, the last time I actually built a model for um, Alphabet or the parent company of Google was back in April. And that was, I guess, five, six months ago. And back then for Alphabet, my conservative um, intrinsic value was around 156 and the optimistic intrinsic value was 183. And I think this was well covered in one of my previous videos when I was explaining my entire portfolio. So I just essentially pulled back um, or put out the old model that I built. And this was, uh, luckily I checked all the formulas, it should be safe and it should be correct. But there are a few things that were slightly different when compared to this new model. And so I've already um, edited the numbers and made sure that the formula is right. So if you do want the most updated um, Excel sheet, link I will put it in the description below. And I've also updated in my previous um, video here. So you can also look at it in the video description. But anyway, I think there were a few large differences on why there is this difference in intrinsic value that happened essentially. But the biggest issue, or at least the projection, when I started out compared to earlier this year was the difference in growth in cash from operations. You can see that um, as we are closer to the year, we have greater visibility on how um, Google is going to grow the numbers. Essentially reduce down the growth rate from 12% to 8%. So that's one huge hit or reduction in terms of intrinsic value. And secondly, it's really the expectations of how Google is going to grow their capital expenditure. So at the start of the year, or at least in the first half of the year, I only expected them to maybe grow 30% to around $42 billion uh, in terms of yearly run rate. But essentially, um, I think close to the end of the year, we see that Google is really aggressively building out the capex, building out infrastructure, investing into Google Cloud, buying NVIDIA chips, etc, etc. And just into these three quarters alone, we already see the numbers of um, the capex to be nearer to $44, $45 billion. So that's a lot higher than the $42 billion that I projected initially. So I think it's just a, I guess, um, double whammy where you have top line of cash from operations re um, increasing or growing at a smaller rate, while capex, which is the expenses, growing at a much larger clip. That's why cash flow was basically um, uh, much lower than expected. Basically, the biggest error in when I uploaded the video was that I did not check the formula for when I do the discounting. So as we all know, DCF, it's a short form of discounted cash flow. What you're essentially doing is projecting out the future cash flows of the company for every single year and then assign a terminal multiple and then discount all the cash flow back. So long story short, in 2025, you're discounted by one year, 2026, two years, 2027, three years, etc, etc. But in the previous model, in this video specifically, um, I did not check the formula. The formula basically got screwed up. I think it was probably due to some dragging, like I wanted to apply the formula and I dragged and it didn't account for that one, two, three to the power of um, based on the years. Um, that's why I think the discounting had some issues and that's why the intrinsic value seems a lot bigger and the model seems a lot more conservative. But I've since right that wrong. So I think the discounting, yes, it is correct for now. And on the third point on what's the largest difference between um, the previous April projection versus now is really when I assign the terminal multiple where in the earlier part of the year, I assigned a 22 times, while now I'm being a lot more conservative by applying 18 times free cash flow multiple. 
So that's why after all these um, adjustments, I got the newest intrinsic value to be around, um, I guess, of 144, which is trading at around an 8% premium. So just a few things that I wanted to take note here is the idea that please always check your workings. And especially when you're posting things online, um, I'm, I probably get screwed. I screwed up big time. I'm sorry. And yes, I need to be a lot more careful uh, moving forward from here. So that's the first point. Secondly, I think when you look at valuation as a skill set, it's really both art and science. Art meaning there really is no correct answer by saying that, hey, um, Google is supposed to be worth XYZ at today's dollar terms. And at the same time, you'll probably realize that, hey, um, different YouTubers or different investment analysts will have different price targets and different numbers. And it seems like all these numbers, um, people online just pull numbers out of the air or out of their ass. And I think it's true to a certain extent, but I think the more important thing is really the story that you're trying to tell yourself and how, um, based on this story, how you're gonna project forward the expectations and the numbers that they're gonna deliver. I guess the science part is really the idea of numbers. I'm um, crunching the numbers, what is an, a reasonable percentage growth, what is a reasonable margin, etc., etc. So specifically in this model, I think I just wanted to outline a few things that um, that, that is extremely important for you to keep at the back of your mind. Um, of course, the first thing is don't trust the internet. Even I screw up in the best of my intentions. Um, yes, I admit that I screw up. I think on the second thing, really the idea of this projection, there's a very important factor here that people tend to, I guess, forget or don't expect is the idea of a terminal multiple equals to investor's excitement. So what do I mean by that? So the stark contrast and intrinsic value, which is 144 um, versus this figure that we got at the earlier part of this year, which is 156. Why is there such a big difference? It's actually um, only one figure that is causing havoc here, which is um, the terminal multiple that you apply. 18 times versus 22 times, I'll bring the price target up to 170 and then um, Google will become um, undervalued by 7%. And then you might ask, oh, how do I determine what's a correct free cash flow multiple? Um, firstly, I can't give you an answer. I don't think there's a correct free cash flow multiple. You can backtrack and to look at the range bound that they essentially trade in. But I guess in a high environment or in a bullish environment, stocks tend to trade at a very high premium or very high multiple. The same is true in a bearish environment, uh, multiples are low. But I think one rule of thumb that I tend to follow is whenever you look at things like, um, do you apply 18 times, 22 times, 25 times? You can look at it from two perspectives. One is on a relative valuation perspective, which is what I did in the previous video, which is you see um, the backtrack, the last 10 years, where Alphabet has been trading at, and then you look at the range, and then you determine something that, or a number, a range of number that is comfortable. On the second part is really the idea of trying to take into account the environment that we're in. So essentially, I think long story short, when we say that a company is trading at a 18 times free cash flow multiple, what it really means is if you just do a one divided by 18, um, it's basically providing you a 5.5% free cash flow yield. So essentially, if you were to treat the company as a bond, um, this bond is paying you 5.5% compared to the other alternatives. And I think in current risk-free environment, you are probably getting closer to 4 to 5% on um, treasury bills. But as you know, um, this might not be the new normal. Maybe the rates will come down to 3 or 2, 3%. So you can kind of project out in 2028, what's the yield that you want to get on your, um, I guess, investment. So 5.5%, it might be 2%, 2.5% above the risk-free rate. Um, and on top of that, you get the potential of a company growing its um, top line cash flow and basically benefiting the shareholder in the long run through buybacks, through dividends, etc. So um, this is the second way of how I look at it. I think a 5.5% yield, it's on the higher side because we see a lot of the other tech companies today they're probably trading closer to 4%, 3%. But don't also forget that there is this idea of a stock-based compensation that will dilute you. So I think take everything into account. I think 18 times multiple um, is definitely on the more conservative end. So, and on point number three, um, um, you need to tell yourself the story that is important here. So I think I went back to relook at my numbers and there's an important story that I talked about in the previous video, but it, didn't, it wasn't really accounted for in the numbers. So this is usually what happens. The company will go into a large CAPEX investment cycle. So you see the CAPEX um, jacking up by a large extent. And then in the following two to three years, it will slowly taper off. Then they will push up the price and reinvest and to build infrastructure. And then it will start to slowly taper off again. So this is basically what we saw in 2018-2019. 
2018 to 2020. So they jacked up their capex and then it went down um, by a bit in the next two years. And in 2021, they started slowly stepping it up. 2022, that's when they increased by 30%. Um, 2023, it slowed down again. Then now 2024, this is when the whole AI boom um, with the NVIDIA chips and whatnot. That's why there's this huge step up. But I guess in my own previous account or previous projection, I did not account for this slowdown. So this is basically what I'm expecting. In 2024, there's this huge step up. 2025, it slows down. Um, I am probably expecting some sort of a negative growth rate in CAPEX, which would be helpful to boost the free cash flow. But that's not what I'm going to do because I want to be conservative. I say that they will just remain constant at 0% and then um, I'll try to increase it back up again out into 2028. So that's basically my expectations. And um, this is the story that I'm telling. Of course, um, you are feel free to download the Excel in the link below and just input your own numbers and your own story. I can't tell you what's the right answer, but I think this is something that I'm comfortable to work with. And, and the second part to this story is really um, trying to discover and investigate the margins on free cash flow and cash from operations. And I've tabulated over the last five years, this is what they've done. Um, their free cash flow margin on the lows, they were around 17%, and in the highs in 2021 it was 26%. Their cash from operations on the lows was around 32%, and on the highs it was 36%. Out into my projections of 2028, using the same 21% free cash flow margin, I get around a revenue or expected revenue of $545 billion, and using a 33% cash flow from operations margin, which is also the median number, um, I get around a projection of 532 billion in revenue for 2028. So when I look at analyst estimates for out into 2028, I get a range of numbers of between 490 billion to 550 billion. And you can probably argue that I'm being really optimistic or at least I'm the optimistic side of the camp. And I do agree. I do think that Alphabet will be able to grow into this valuation and uh, around a 520 to 540 billion revenue um, in the next four years, I think it's doable um, considering its past track record and the growth trajectory that it's headed towards. Considering that now you understand the context and my own interpretation of Google's valuations today, you might then point to the price target of 144 and ask me, hey, why are you still bullish about Google at the low 150s? Don't you want to buy under intrinsic value or to buy at a discount? I think to myself, um, there's, re there's really important contextual understanding here that needs to be conveyed. So firstly, I just attempted to try to project out um, or to share my story in terms of numbers. Because if not, everything becomes very woo-woo. But at the same time, I do think that these are very conservative estimates. Um, first things first, I do think that Google is probably under-optimized right now. And if they are able to really optimize their cost structure and their margins, we are going to see much greater growth ahead um, in terms of cash from operations. That's first things. Secondly, I do think that CAPEX, even projecting out into 2028, um, them spending over $60 billion per year, um, I don't know whether you think it's high or low, but I do think that I'm trying to overscore or at least try to put a bigger number so that our ultimate valuations become smaller. So that's also my expectations. I think long story short for point one and point two is that we are going to look at free cash flow margins expanding. Point number two is really this exit multiple that we are tagging here. So 18 times, you can say that it's high, you can say that it's low. But I do think that if Google, um, this tech juggernaut, being probably one of the highest quality businesses out there, um, assuming that ChatGPT and whatever doesn't come into the picture, um, investors are going to be excited again. They are probably willing to pay a much higher multiple for this steady steadiness of cash flow of income coming to Google. And if people are excited, I think it going to 20 times, 22 times, 25 times, it's not unheard of and it's probably quite normal um, in the near future. So that's why I do think of this multiple expansion as one of the key drivers as well. So um, first thing, which is free cash flow expansion. Secondly, which is um, multiple expansion. And thirdly, I think it's also important to understand um, the individual investors context. So even after adding Google at around the $150 range, um, my, I was actually averaging up. Meaning to say my average cost on the position itself is below 144. 
So that's why I was fine adding to it. But if you're asking me, oh, today, is it a good time to add to Google? I will tell you it's a decent time, but it's not the best time. You can probably pick it up um, at a greater discount when there really is legitimate fears around Google today. If not, at today's valuation, I do think that it's kind of fairly valued, um, not too cheap, not too expensive. So I'm not saying or advocating to throw in the kitchen sink and to go all in into Google. But I do think that at today's current valuation, they do offer a pretty interesting risk to reward. So with that, I hope this correction video goes out to as many people as possible. I once again apologize and I will be a lot more careful in my subsequent videos. If not, I'll see you guys in the next video. But more importantly, and hopefully, I'll see you guys all on the moon. Goodbye.